for that. Beautiful song. Oh, man. I never heard that one before. That was awesome. I'm really excited to talk more about that love today. If you remember, we've been in our series on discipleship, and if you remember the past two times that I've preached on this subject, the first time I preached about us needing to be devoted to together, we looked at the early church. We saw how they were devoted to doing everything together, especially discipling each other. And last week, we looked at our premier example of what it means to be a disciple, and that is Jesus Christ Himself. And we saw how Jesus, even though He was God in flesh, He stooped down and He washed His disciples' feet. And we talked about how different things about discipleship... I remember, if you remember, I gave you the T on discipleship, which means the theme of discipleship is love, and the enemy of discipleship is pride, but the attitude of discipleship is servitude. All these things that Jesus embodied. So the past two times, I've really talked about horizontal discipleship, which is a lot of what we've been talking about. But I think it's important for us to be able to take a step back and understand that if we're not vertically discipled as well, there's no way we can horizontally disciple. So we're going to look at one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament today. If you come on Sunday nights, you know I love the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament because everything in the Old Testament points to my Lord and Savior Jesus. And it's such a beautiful picture of His love for us that we see. But before we jump into it today, I want us to all take a step back into our childhood for a second. If you can remember back that far. It's not that long ago for me. I'm only 25, so my childhood wasn't very long ago. I grew up in the age of pictures, so I have a lot of pictures from my childhood to remind me of my childhood as well. But I want to think, I want you to think for a minute, though, about some of the outfits that you picked out to wear for yourself as a child. You know, there's a point in your life when you're growing up and your parents pick out all your clothes for you, right? They tell you, this is what you're going to wear this day. It's laid out. It's a great time, right? But then parents have to let you practice a little bit of autonomy. And you get to start picking out your own clothes. And if you know anything about children, I see Kelly smiling a little bit back there. They don't always pick out the best clothes to wear, do they? No. We don't always make good decisions. I remember, I remember seeing pictures from me during that part of my childhood. My sense of fashion isn't what it is today. My favorite go-to clothing outfits was a pair of plaid shorts and striped polos. If you don't know anything about fashion, plaid and stripes do not go together. They do not look good at all. But my parents only practiced at autonomy. I eventually figured it out sooner or later. We don't always pick the right things to wear. I'm sure Kelly could tell us some stories about the girls trying to wear tutu dresses or something to church. But that's not what we want to wear. We don't want princess dresses to church. We want church clothes to church. And it's so important. That's what parents are there for. They're there to make sure that we are dressed for the occasion, that we are prepared for the occasion at hand. I see many of you today realize that today was St. Patrick's Day. I, when Brother Randy walked in in that striking green sports coat looking like he just won a Masters tournament, I was wondering, I was like, man, where's Randy been recently? And then I looked at my phone after choir practice and went, oh, today is St. Patrick's Day. Somebody's going to pinch me later because I went for the drab gray and black today. I was like, not, not an ounce of color on my body. But some of y'all remember today was St. Patrick's Day, and it ties in so well with our message today because as we read earlier, Joseph had a coat too. Joseph had a coat that he really liked a lot. He wore it everywhere and this is the story that we're going to look at today. We're going to go through Joseph's life and examine the story. And we're going to see how it's applicable to us today. So today, we're going to look at one story with two main applications. Again, one story, two main applications. And it all starts a long, long time ago in a land very far from here, the Promised Land. We understand Abraham. We understand Sarah. We understand they had Isaac. Isaac married Rebecca. They had two children. They had Esau and they had Jacob. We know how the story goes there. And this follows the line of Jacob, 
whom the blessing was placed upon and whom the promises were going to descend through. And we read earlier in this chapter about all the sons that he had. We understand that he had 12 sons. But we see here, he had a favorite son. And his favorite son's name was Joseph. Now, most parents, if they do have a favorite, they try to hide it pretty well. Jacob, he didn't make too many attempts to hide the love for this son. This son was attached to his hip. He was his favorite for several reasons. One, Joseph was kind of a goody two-shoes. He didn't like doing all the miscreant stuff that his brothers were over there doing. In fact, he'd come back and tell his father about all the, about all the bad activities that his brothers were doing in the fields way far away while they were off from dad. So he liked him for that reason, but the main reason he loved Joseph so much is that he was the firstborn of his beloved Rachel, the wife that he had worked 14 years for. Even after that, remember he worked seven years, was promised Rachel, was given Leah instead. Then he had to work seven more years for Rachel, and he did it with a smile on his face. The Bible tells us that it was like a passing moment for him because he loved her so much. And out of Rachel, she bore him two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. So, Joseph being the firstborn of his beloved, Joseph was his beloved son, especially since Rachel had passed away during the the birth process of Benjamin. So, Joseph and Benjamin were really the only remnants that he had left, and he clung on to them, and he showed his love for them, and he showed his love for Joseph, where he gave him what we call Joseph's coat of many colors. Joseph loved that coat. He wore that coat everywhere. Anytime he went to go do anything, he was wearing that coat to show the Father's favor. And that's really what that coat was. The, the coat that Jacob had given to Joseph was a coat of the Father's favor, of the favor and the love that Jacob had for him. So, of course, he wore it everywhere. His brothers didn't like that so much. His brothers became envious. His brothers became jealous, and they were just mad about all these different things. But to top it all off, Joseph started having these, these kind of weird dreams about sheaves of wheat that were bowing down to him and about the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars all coming down and bowing to them. And of course, you know, Joseph, having these weird dreams, he told his family, and he told his brothers and everybody about it which they're like, do you expect that we're all going to bow down to you someday? Now, some people here, they accuse, they accuse Joseph of a little bit of pridefulness, and it might have been a little bit of pridefulness, but I think if I had some weird dreams like that, I think I'd want to tell somebody about them too. But needless to say, these dreams made his brothers hate him and envy him even more. So one day, the brothers are out in the fields taking care of the sheep, Joseph's at home, and his dad sends him out to him. He says, go check on your brothers, bring a report back to me. So Joseph, in his coat of many colors, starts making his way down towards Hebron, where his brothers were. Gets a little lost, the guy points him in the right direction, and his brothers see him coming from a long way off, and they say to each other, here comes that dreamer. Here comes this brother of ours who we can't stand. We're way out here away from dad. The wilderness is a dangerous place. We got a plan. We're going to kill him. And that'll show him about these dreams that he's been having. That'll show him he's no better than us. All the brothers were on board except for one brother, Reuben. He realized that's not a very good idea. He didn't want to kill his brother. It doesn't mean that he necessarily liked his brother, but he definitely didn't want to kill his brother. So he comes up with a plan to not kill him, but they throw him in a pit. Reuben's going to come back later and he's going to rescue him. He's going to get him out of that pit. So they, what happens, he gets there, the brother sees him, they rip his coat off of him, they tear it into shreds, and they beat him to a pulp and they throw him in a pit. The rest of the brothers are still content to kill him. Reuben's trying to work his plan to get him out of there. But in the meantime, some Ishmaelites start passing by. There's a caravan of them going to Egypt. And the brothers' greed gets the better of them. And they realize, hey, why kill them when we can make a little bit of money off of them? So before Reuben is able to get his brother out of the pit and return him back to his father, 
the brothers take them out of the pit and they sell them off into slavery. No longer wearing the coat of many colors, this coat of the Father's favor. Now, when we think of the life of Joseph, and we think about the coats of Joseph, most of the time we stop and we, we think this is the only coat that Joseph ever wore. But what we're going to see today is that Joseph had a coat closet full of coats that the Lord had prepared especially for him. What happens next is the brothers go and they kill one of the bulls, I mean not one of the bulls, one of the rams, the male rams, and they soak his blood in it and they take it back to his father acting as if they didn't know what happened. They say, Father, Father, look, is this the coat of your son? Not even to have the respect to call him his brother, their brother. But is this the coat of your son? And Jacob took that coat and he looked at it and he began to weep and he said, yes, this is the coat of my son. And he was inconsolable for days and weeks and he said, surely I will grieve myself down to Sheol where my son is. And the brothers were okay with that. We'll see that over time through the years, Jacob never really gets over it. We see later, even after all the years later, when they make their way to Egypt, a little bit of a spoiler alert, he's still not over the death of his son. And the brothers come to light, even though they're not very good people. The Lord works in them, shows them their wrongs. He breaks down their hearts to show them their error. But that's what the brothers do. They went to him. But in the meantime, we see Joseph has made his way to Egypt. He's been sold into Potiphar's house where he will wear his next coat, his coat of servitude. And shortly after he began his work within Potiphar's house, Potiphar noticed that there's something different about this young man over here. Now Joseph wasn't very old. It tells us here he was 17 years old when all this happened. If you want a rough estimate, look at Rush back there. He's not quite 17, but he's, he's close a young man, but he knows there's something different about this young man over here. And he knew that whatever Joseph touched, it turned into good. Whatever he touched, it prospered because the Lord was with him. So he put him his head over his household. He gave him everything in his house to look over to where the Bible tells us that Potiphar didn't even concern himself with the things of his house because he trusted Joseph that much so as he's wearing this coat of faithful servitude, a temptation arises. Because although Potiphar had given him everything, he had not given him one thing, which was his wife. But Potiphar's wife had eyes for Joseph. And she wanted him. And it tells us that day after day she approached him, saying, lay with me. But Joseph would continually say, no, no, no. He, he told her, your husband, my master, has given me everything under his house. You are the one thing he has not given me. How could I break the trust of my master like this? But she continued, she continued, and one day she had him cornered. One day he was doing his job, faithfully serving his master, Potiphar, and it came about that she was called alone with him. And she took hold of Joseph and she said, D she said, now, take me now, lay with me. And Joseph, not knowing what to do, he took off running. And she had such a tight grip on him that she tore the robe off of him and he ran away. Her realizing that she had this, the stories that would get out if it made it back to her husband, she decided to make up a story for herself. A story about how this Hebrew slave tried to take advantage of her. And she told everybody, and now the wind of this rumor, this lie had made its way back to Potiphar, and Potiphar was understandably very, very angry. So although Joseph faithfully served, and we can even say, in this case, he sinlessly served, he innocently served his master, this coat of sinless servitude turned quickly into the coat 
of unjust persecution. This coat of unjust, unfair condemnation that fell upon him. Because when Potiphar heard, his fury raged inside of him. He took Joseph, he threw him deep within the cells of the jail. Now, if I were Joseph at this point, I would be asking a lot of questions. One of them would probably be, God, why have you brought me all the way here? God, why have you shown me so much favor just for it to turn out like this? God, I've done everything right. I did nothing wrong, yet I'm being punished. It doesn't make sense to me. But we see that even within the jail cell, even as he was stripped of his robes of servitude, and he put on the coat of unjust persecution, that he faithfully served even in that. We see Joseph was in jail for a long time. A long time. Upwards of ten years he was in this jail. But even while he was in the jail, he continued to faithfully serve and God was with him and everything he touched even when he was in the jail prospered. And the head over the jail noticed how everything he touched prospered. And he made him head over the jail, over over the part of the cell that he was in, the part of the jail that he was in. So Joseph served, even faithfully through the unjust persecution. Then one day as he's serving, two men joined his company in his part of the jail, the king's cupbearer and the king's baker. And they were there for various reasons. Pharaoh at the time was very upset with them for whatever reason, but he threw them deep within the jail as well. Shortly thereafter, they started having some weird dreams too. And the cupbearer started talking to Joseph, and he said, Man, can you explain what this dream means to me? There's these three branches of grapes. And I'm taking those grapes and I'm squeezing them into this cup and I'm handing it back to Pharaoh. And God allows Joseph to interpret this dream. He says, the three branches of grapes are within three days. And within three days, you will be restored as the king's cupbearer. Hearing that he gave the cupbearer a pretty favorable report, the baker was like, man, I had a weird dream too. Tell me what it means. So he goes to Joseph. And he tells them, in my dream I have three baskets of bread on my head, but the birds are coming by and they're devouring the bread. Joseph tells him the same thing. The three baskets represent three days, and within three days you're going to be killed. Not a very favorable report. It's important to note, though, that both these things came to pass exactly as he is interpreted within these dreams. And the one thing that he had asked the cupbearer was, Whenever you get next to Pharaoh again, tell him of me and how I've been unjustly put in this situation so that he can get me out of this dungeon. Cupbearer goes and is restored. But the Bible tells us that for two years he forgot about Joseph. Now again, if I were Joseph, I'd be asking, Lord, You've given me the ability to interpret these people's dreams. Lord, you've given me what seems like a path out of here. God, why am I still rotting away in this jail cell when I could be doing so much more for you, God? Why do you still have me here? Why have you put this man in my life who has the ability to to spring me from this prison, yet he's forgotten about me? For two years after this, he continued to be in that jail. Till one day, Pharaoh himself started having weird dreams about big, healthy cows. I'm a cow farmer. We like big, healthy cows. But out of the river came these seven scrawny cows. So you had seven healthy cows, seven scrawny cows, and the seven scrawny cows, they came out and they devoured the healthy ones. That's pretty strange. It's a weird dream. He had another dream, though. It wasn't just one dream. He had two dreams. The other one was a stalk that grew out of the ground with seven good ears on it. But then those seven ears withered away and then another sprout sprung up, another shoot sprung up with seven terrible, wind-beaten, sun-scorched ears on it. 
And Pharaoh was concerned. And Pharaoh went to everybody he could. And nobody could tell Pharaoh what his dreams meant. And the cupbearer remembered. There's a guy in prison who could tell me my dream. I bet you he can tell Pharaoh his dream as well. So the cupbearer tells Pharaoh. Pharaoh sees. And Pharaoh's like, I'll take help from anybody right now. So he sends his guards to go get him. And it tells us there that as they go get him, they strip off his coats of unjust persecution, his prison clothes that he was wearing. They scrub them up good. They shave them. They make him presentable and they put on this coat of kingly approval is what it is. The coat that he had to wear, the dress that he had to wear, the hygiene that was necessary for him to approach the king of Egypt. So they scrub them down good and they bring them before the king and the king Pharaoh tells them about this dream that he had had. And Joseph tells them, King, these two dreams that you've had, they're one and the same. And here's what they mean. There's going to be seven good years of plenty. But after those seven good years, there's going to be seven years of famine. So Joseph gives him the plan. Take a step back. Pharaoh wanted Joseph to give him. It's also important to note that Joseph stood on his faith, showing what a man of faith he was. He said, I cannot give it to you, but God can give it to you. Pretty important point of the story right there. <laughs> Don't want to miss that part. But he tells them his dreams. He gives them the plan. And Pharaoh takes off his coat of kingly approval and gives him something even better. And that's the coat of the king himself. He takes off his signet ring that he used to seal everything. And he puts it on Joseph's finger. And he told him, nobody in the kingdom is above you except for me now. You are second in the kingdom. As you have done, go and do. And because of Joseph's faithfulness, we'll read later that everybody was saved through the famine because of his actions. So he took off the coat of kingly approval. He put on the coat of the king, which is really a coat of salvation for all is what it is. There's the one story. Now, the story has two main applications to it. If you don't get the first application, don't even worry about the second application because the first application means everything. As I said earlier, I love the Old Testament because everything points to Jesus. And it's important to understand types in the Old Testament about how things are reflected of Jesus, which is later to come. But the story of Joseph, Joseph himself is the premier type of the suffering servant in the Old Testament. As we know, Jesus Christ is, was the suffering servant who came to suffer for our sins. The Jewish rabbis understood that this was messianic as well. One of the things they would do is they were scribbling, not scribbling, but as they were remaking, writing out the Torah over and over again, sometimes they'd have margins and they would write notes within the margin, things that they thought were important that needed to be passed down. And one of the things that one of the scribes wrote that we can see today is right next to this story. He wrote Messiah ben Yosef, which means Messiah, son of Joseph. We typically understand Jesus to be the son of David, the son of the king, the reigning king. But Jesus is more than just the king. He was the suffering servant, just as Joseph was. And everything in this story points to Jesus Christ. So let's walk back through this story again with that in mind. Jesus, the beloved of the Father, robed in majesty and glory, forever in the presence of God in heaven, wore the coat of His Father's favor, of His Father's love for Him. But Jesus willingly stripped Himself of that coat to put on the coat of sinless servitude and faithful servitude to His Father. He took off that coat, disrobed Himself and said, God, I will go down and I will be the person who will make a way for them no matter what the cost is. No matter how hard it is, God, I will faithfully and sinlessly serve You. And as a result of His faithful and sinless servitude of God, that he, the coat that He wore that, we understand that Jesus also had to wear the coat of unjust persecution. Because even though Jesus did nothing wrong, the Pharisees and the religious people at the time hated Him because they were disrupting everything that they had going on. 
and they wanted to kill him, and they found and they had and they executed this plot to take care of Jesus. Where they arrested him, they beat him, they ripped his beard out, they spit upon him, they punched him in the face, they whipped him, and they nailed him to a cross, all unjustly. So Jesus wore that coat of unjust persecution for you and for me. But because Jesus wore that coat for us, He could wear the next two coats as well. The book of Hebrews is a fantastic book. We're encouraging y'all as you read through Leviticus to read through Hebrews as well. But Hebrews tells us that upon His death and upon His resurrection, upon His ascension, Jesus, when He got into heaven, He walked into the tabernacle that was not made by human hands, but made by the hands of God Himself that is in heaven, the place where God rules from. He walked in there and He presented His blood to God. The blood, the only blood, that could be propitiation for you and for me. That could atone for the sins of you and me and everybody who's ever lived. And He presented it to God. It tells us that God accepted that sacrifice. He accepted that offering. So Jesus was able to wear the coat of kingly approval. But because of that, Jesus was also able to put back on the coat of the King. And that's how He's coming back. Amen. King of all. Salvation for all is what He grants to you and to me. So I hope that you can see through this story, this is not just a story about Joseph, but this is a story about our Lord and Savior. It's not just Joseph's coat closet, but this is Jesus' coat closet that we're looking at right here. Jesus died for you and for me. We deserve to wear the coat of not unjust persecution, but ours would be just persecution. But Jesus took it upon Himself. The first step to being a disciple of Jesus is recognizing Jesus as your Lord and Jesus as your Savior, which means you recognize Him as Master of your life and as Savior of your life. Three simple steps that we say. You have to confess your sins to the Lord. You have to repent of your sins. Place your faith in Him. And the hardest part is surrender your life to Him as Lord and Savior. Like I said earlier, if you don't get this part, the, the rest of it doesn't even matter. And I hope that if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that today will be the day that you will. Jesus suffered for you and for me. Took the punishment that we deserve so that we could have salvation. We have this free gift. That's the first application. The second application is this. Many times in life, we think that we can choose the coats that we get to wear at any point in time. We think that we're able to control our lives. We think that we're able to control our circumstances. We think we're able to control the world around us. If we were Joseph in this story, nobody would have given up the coat of many colors. Nobody would have given up the coat of the Father's love because that was a safe place. That was a good place to be. But what we notice in this story is that if Joseph wouldn't have wore those other coats, if Joseph wouldn't have went through those trials and persecutions, if he wouldn't have suffered through that, there wouldn't have been salvation for everybody. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people would have starved to death in that famine if it weren't for Joseph. If Joseph wasn't a faithful servant throughout his life, throughout his circumstances, throughout whatever position that God had put him in, there would never have been salvation for all. I think that's something of the utmost importance for us to remember in our lives today. Trust me. I like simple. I like easy. I like comfortable just as much as anybody else. And I'm not saying I'm perfect in this by any means, but it's something I strive for, and that is faithfulness despite the circumstances. I'm sure if all of us think about our life, and we think back on all the deep waters that we've tread through, none of us would have chosen to go through those deep waters, would we? But what happened on the other side 
of those trials? What happened on the other side of those tribulations? How many people have we impacted in our lives by our witness through those trials and by our faithfulness through the end of it? See, if we want to be a good disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have to be faithful despite the circumstances. I was telling some people earlier, God hit me really hard with this last night. Kristen was there. She knows about 8 o'clock last night I had the most severe pain I've ever felt in my entire life. Start right here in my lower back on my right side. Went on for hours all through the night. Pretty sure it was a kidney stone moving at this point. But I laid there last night in excruciating pain. I'm like, Lord, I'm supposed to preach tomorrow. God, <laughs> what is happening to me right now? I'm not going to lie. I wanted to call Sam and tell him, Sam, there ain't no way, man. Sam, there's no way I can make this. But instead, I was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. Because I, I knew my passage. I knew what I was going to be preaching on today. And it just kept ringing through my head. It was like, despite the circumstances, despite the circumstances, despite the circumstances. And I was like, all right, we're just going to pray. And I'm like, Lord, if you want me to preach tomorrow, Lord, I pray that you'll take this pain away and that when I get up in the morning, I'll be able to function. And I was like, if you want to put me back through pain after that, Lord, that's okay, cool, whatever. But Lord, just let me be able to serve. I can't tell you what time I went to sleep last night. It was a long time. I kept Kristen up most of the night, hollering and yelling and at one point, I woke her up. It was 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, somewhere close. I was like, if this doesn't get any better, we're going to the hospital. But despite that, the Lord was faithful through that. As we sung about this morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is always faithful to our calls. It's a matter of we're going to be faithful back as well. So in our vertical discipleship, we have to be committed to faithfulness to our Lord and Savior, despite the circumstances. So as we have our time of invitation here, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the for first point of application, if you've never made the decision in your life to follow Jesus, to recognize Him as Lord and Savior, today is the day. Salvation is a free gift that was bought at a heavy price for you and for me. Don't leave here today without making that decision. But if you're here today and you know that you're a follower, but you're walking through deep waters right now, you're going through hard times, you're struggling with faithfulness, bring that to the Lord today. One thing the Lord is good at doing, He can increase our faith at the snap of His fingers. I know I've needed help with that so many times in my life. So respond to how the Lord is moving in your heart today. Don't sit there if the Lord is stirring. Be faithful despite the circumstances. If you all stand, we'll pray and then we'll have our invitation. Dear God, Lord, we are thankful, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. God, we are thankful that you never leave nor forsake us, God. But Lord, I pray that you'll make us into a church of people who are faithful despite the circumstances people who are ready to take on whatever coat that you would have us wear at any particular time in our life. God, help us to be willing to step out of our comfort zones, God, Lord, to be, and to step into the roles that you want us to have. God, help us to be better disciples of your Son, Jesus. It's in His name we pray. Amen.